Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Hi, everyone. MP Garnet Jenis, your host here. Welcome back to another episode of Resuming Debate. So uh, from time to time, uh, there are these issues that crop up where all of a sudden we get a flurry of correspondence at my constituency office. Uh, and, uh, and then I have to dig into and, and find out, well, what's, what's this issue all about? 15-minute cities is, is one such issue. There, uh, there has been a, a tidal wave of public interest in this issue. It's a, a, at first blush to me, it's, it seems like a municipal and urban planning issue, but I, I've been encouraged by constituents to, to dig into this issue, and, and I'm excited to be able to bring you a, an interesting uh, podcast pair of interviews uh, on the issue of 15-minute cities. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk to two different people with uh, different takes on the topic and get their perspective on what you need to know about 15-minute cities and, and what those of us as, as political leaders need to do about it. So for the first half hour, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Douglas Farrow. Uh, he's a professor of theology and ethics at McGill. He's been at McGill uh, for over 25 years. So Douglas, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad you're doing this and thanks for having me. If you could just start by, I, I assume there's going to be people that come to this episode with a lot of thoughts about 15-minute cities, but there may also be people who, who have, have heard it, seen it posted about online and, and don't know what it's all about. So, so what is this concept of 15-minute cities and uh, why is it important? Essentially, it's, it's uh, an attempt to design or redesign cities into smaller compartmentalized structures in which, within which uh, people will have ready access to basic uh, necessities and conveniences without having to travel far, to be able to walk or bicycle, to uh, cycle to what uh, they're looking for. The idea is to, in part, to produce a, a calmer, a more human way of life and to live in a fashion that is uh, less bound up with the rat race and the the commuting and the polluting and all of that sort of business that we're familiar with in many of our large urban centers. So, you know, that's that's one side of it. The other side of it is that um, that these are to be smart cities. There to be cities in which there is a very powerful grid of uh, computerized connectivity. This is part of the fourth industrial revolution, so-called, and these cities are are the sort of model centers of of that culture where everything is connected to everything. So I, I guess on first blush, it seems like minus the smart cities part, this is probably how people used to live at one point in the past, right? Where it was just a reality that you you couldn't travel that far out of your immediate environs, you know, because you know, before before cars, before subways, before these kinds of things, that that was that was just an inevitable inevitable reality. But now people have a broader level of preferences. They may they may not just want to go to the pub down the street. They may want to be able to you know go for Vietnamese food that may not be available immediately where they are, but it may be available downtown. Uh, but also uh, work you know for for people who work at a university, you may you may you may live in a suburb the suburbs which may be more conducive to family life. But then you work at the university. If you're all, all kinds of, of professionals uh, or or people seeking particular kinds of entertainment are going to inevitably want to venture outside of their their immediate area. So it, it, it seems no, a bit unrealistic on first blush, I guess, just well, given the way we it, live, it, right? Yes. I mean, it seems unrealistic on many levels. That is, in order to create these model cities, you, you have to either create new cities as say, you know, as being experimented with in 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 some places in the Middle East uh, or in China, or you have to basically demolish parts of old existing cities, uh, move those people out of the way and create a new sort of model community in 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 its place. So there are all sorts of Problems arise, of course, uh, once you start looking at it in that light, and and nobody is is uh, I think proposing at this point that everyone must live in such a city and that no one can leave the the community within that city 
of which they are part. So there will have to be provision for travel between places, but there's there's a, a, a very large uh, climate change component to this. So, so the, part of the thinking is to cut down travel and to cut down emissions that result from travel. And again, uh, it, it's hard to understand how that would be very practical. Uh, because, of course, you're talking about enormous construction, uh, indeed demolition and reconstruction, uh, and all of this will produce uh, emissions, quite apart from the question of whether the, the climate change catastrophism is founded in actual reality and whether, the, and whether climate science properly conducted supports this catastrophism. Uh, my own view is that it does not, and I'm certainly not alone in that view. Uh, so again, that's a third angle that needs to be considered in all of this. Yeah, I, I think I think the proponents of this concept they, they might push back and say, "Look, we're not we're not proposing to to bulldoze and rebuild everything. We're just saying that, like, wouldn't it be nice if?" And can we build these, think about these principles in the context of, of new areas or cases where there's urban design happening? You know, wouldn't it be nice if you wanted to go out for dinner and, and there was a place you could walk to instead of needing to go downtown? Wouldn't it be nice if there were, there were public parks and, and, and general amenities that were close and accessible within your, your area? And, you know, it's not, it's not an absolute thing and, and we get that it'll be hard to get there, but, you know, maybe from an environmental perspective, but also just from a lifestyle perspective, perspective that abstractly doesn't this sound like a nice thing to sort of try to work towards that you can get to the things that you need within a short with a short commute instead of a long commute well sure but i mean urban planners and i'm not an urban planner and don't profess this kind of expertise but but urban planners have been working at that sort of thing for a long time so yeah. i live in a community where it's a small community on the island of montreal and it doesn't have hardly any amenities of its own, uh, outdoor rinks and and mm -hmm. uh, you know a very small shopping center for your food and and that sort of thing. But not many. It, it's a wonderful community. But if we want something, we have to get in the car and and go for it. Out in the prairies where these communities exist, they can't all have everything. So often, as you know very well, people have to get in their cars and drive to another town, and probably a larger one, in order to get some things. That's the way of life in Canada. Meanwhile, in your local community, if you have a good council, they're, they're creating green spaces or protecting the ones that exist and not letting them all be overrun. There's nothing new about any of that. What's right. new about this is that the central planners, and they're not local urban planners, they're central planners, want to reorganize as far as possible all urban communities, and eventually that will also include rural communities. We'd have to talk about that. Um, they want to reorganize them in such a way that, that people become accustomed to living within the confines of their local community, that they don't have cars, most of them, that they don't have their own means of transport elsewhere except foot and cycle. And they want these cities, you, you mustn't ignore the smart city component of it. Yeah. And, and this is what makes it different from, from say, the uh, medieval town which is centered around a cathedral and, and involves markets locally that bring in produce from the countryside. And there's this, this back and forth between, between the urban center and the rural communities. This isn't like that. This is the kind of thing that we were given a taste of, and I think quite deliberately, during the lockdowns. It's a, you don't need to go to the store, the store will come to you. This is not pick up, this is delivery. Things will be brought to your community. And how will all that happen? Well, there, there will be a grid enabling it to happen. It will be financial and it will be informational. Everything will be run by algorithms responding to uh, uh, the programming of the central planners. And you will be totally dependent upon that, totally dependent upon that, combined with the, uh, with the uh, central bank digital currencies, you will be completely integrated into that system. You will probably yourself eventually become part of the smart grid. 
So right now you have smart appliances and, and smart meters. You yourself will be part of that grid. So everything about you will be known to, to, to those in charge of it. Absolutely everything. There's this component of it that, that, that talks about local community and subsidiarity and sustainability is actually linked to a much larger scheme that is anything but a local community built on subsidiarity principles so that you are running your own life. On the contrary. <laughs> they are running everything that pertains to your life and without them you are you are you're you're helpless so that's the dark side of it so i, I think this is this is the big question fundamentally right because because if you say yeah wouldn't it be nice if you know these things are and and some of the things you're describing if they coexist with choice and freedom i mean they they sound convenient right so if instead of uh needing to go downtown for, uh, I keep, I keep, uh, I guess I'm hungry this morning and you know, I keep thinking Thai food, Vietnamese food, but instead of <laughs> going downtown, uh, for your Thai food, you order it to your door. You know, we, we have, we have that already. Right. And instead of needing to go pick up your groceries, uh, you know, you get a grocery order delivered to you. Right. I mean, or, or maybe, maybe the, the new, the new thing would be, you know, you, you order the groceries and they come to a, a semi-central location within your local community and you could pick them up. Th these things are, are potentially enabling and they would lead to people maybe voluntarily making choices to say, I'm going to, I'm going to travel a little bit less because I need to travel less. And because it's, you know, it's, it's inconvenient to pile the kids into the car and go to the grocery store. I, I think the, the implication of what you're describing is that that this isn't an individual or choice driven process that the, that that the fear is and this is what i hear a lot from constituents is that this is actually linked to a a loss of liberty it's hard to see how that would happen in a free and democratic society right i mean well what makes you think yeah. we live in a free and democratic society i mean the, the last few years we have had a major dose of non-democratic society and honestly, some of the people who are working on these things have been quite open about that. Democracy uh, as a form of government and governance is a product of a certain phase of human development. So we're, we're past that phase. Maybe that worked during the, uh, the first or second or third industrial revolutions. But now in the fourth industrial revolution, it doesn't work like that. Yes, we have all kinds of new conveniences. So we can stay in our 15 minute city and have virtual reality experiences of other places around the world. The one, the, the one that's being constructed in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia is, is, is uh, on, that on steroids. Uh, the, the plans are really quite remarkable. But the, the point is, this technological change and this philosophical change that makes us masters of our own destiny through the use of computers and computer algorithms, this is not a, a, a context anymore for common law and for local uh, democratic processes and for national democratic processes. All of these things change together. They are thinking. They are thinking about these things, and we should be thinking about them too. They're linked. The changes in the way medicine is done, the way the changes in the way the law works, the changes in your rights and, and liberties, the changes in your conveniences. Yes, and the way you work, where you work, how your community is organized. These are all. They have to be integrated. You, you can't do this willy nilly. It 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 needs forethought, and there right. are people making the decisions about what the future will look like. And it doesn't include you very much or very often. Yeah, I think there's going to be some people who hear that and are, are very skeptical of it. Um, well, they should read the literature. Is yeah. what they could, you, could you tell us about the, the concrete examples we see of this? Because I, my impression is that, that there has been some implementation of this concept and there is an effort to discourage travel outside of these, these defined zones. So maybe just, just, if you can provide for for the skeptics, where where are those those concrete uh, applications of this uh, of this potential concept playing out, and and what's happening? I think we've seen them playing out in the past 
three years. We, we have, we've been given, as I said, a major dose of what it's like to live in a delivery society rather than a pickup society. But along with that, of course, has come a major restriction on human liberties. Once you fully digitalize that with smart cities, digital identity, central bank digital currencies, your liberties uh, to make different and contrary choices, to live closer to nature actually, <laughs> mm -hmm. would, be, would be very limited. You will be much more fully dependent on the central planners. C.S. Lewis called them the controllers. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he uh, like Chesterton before him, saw this kind of thing coming a hundred years ago because well he wasn't a hundred years ago chesterton was mm -hmm. because they looked at the trajectories philosophically and legally and technologically and they foresaw the rise of this surveillance capitalism that would overcome democracy abraham lincoln saw it mm -hmm. not not in the same detail but he saw the problem and he spoke of it during already towards the end of the civil war so th these are very large scale movements. I I've written about them at length on my Substack, Desiring a Better Country. And if people are doubtful about this, as I say, they need to read the literature. Mm -hmm. So so what what's what's the literature coming from? And I guess related to that, who who do you think is behind this concept? Like who are the who are the, what are the institutions that are that are driving this? And uh, you know you you talked about what they want a few times. I guess trying to understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so they, <laughs> they is a notoriously flexible term, yes. and, and, uh, and I don't profess to have a full grasp of it, but I have been studying things that help make some identifications. I, I, there are many players here, but the key players are the Chinese Communist Party, which is way ahead of the curve on this, right? And also the World Economic Forum, yes, who philosophically... And also in terms of their public-private partnerships, including ones with our own government, are pretty much ahead of the curve and driving some of it. And there are other, um, there are other players. The, the Americans are heavily involved, and I, I've written about that at length. I think also we need to take into account the, the backgrounds and interests of the pioneers of this idea. Carlos Moreno, you know, a celebrated uh, a French academic, but uh, originally from Colombia, where he was a member of M19, which, which was sort of the Sinn Féin of, of, of his country. And they did the same thing. They murdered, they killed, and then they went political. They dropped the outward violence and, and began to be engaged in the political process. That's his background. He's the, the main pioneer, not the only pioneer, but the main pioneer of the 15-minute city concept. Well, do you want an urban terrorist being your urban planner? I, I'm not sure you do. Now, he can say he's changed his, his stripes, but you know when you start looking at who they are, you do see some rather curious things. So I guess there's there's a lot to, to unpack there with with questions. Um, in terms of you know what's happening in China, uh, the Communist Party. I mean, people will be familiar with the idea of of a social credit score, right? And I think some of the commentary we hear is people saying, "Well, is this you know is this something that's going to happen in other places?" Um, I it personally it seems to me that it seems to me a bit implausible that that we would we would head that way given the political forms that we have. I wouldn't yeah. want to accuse you of naivete, <laughs> but, but if, again, if you, if you examine the stated views and the practices of some of the main players in these public-private partnerships, which are resolving and dissolving our democracy into surveillance capitalism, you will see that these same things, these ESGs, these, these effectively social credit uh, mechanisms are in play, whipping the corporate world into line. Do you think that's going to stop with the corporate world and not going to extend to the citizen? Only if you're committed to the notion that the citizen has absolute rights. But, but look what happened even uh, during the pandemic with the ArriveCan controversy. I myself am a bearer of rights because I'm a human being, but my rights were shifted to a gadget. 
unless I carried the gadget and used the program, I could not come and go. That's the kind of thinking that is endemic in all of this. I become dependent on participation in a smart city scheme, in a digital identity, digitalized money scheme, which serves whom? Not me and my local community, although that's how it's dressed up, but serves the interests of very large corporations and very powerful people and very large philosophies with a lot of ideological weight behind them, such as that in China. And the fact that China is very operative here in North America, as we've been uh, reminded of lately, uh, both uh, overhead and, 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 and underhandedly in the, in the elections, should tell us something there too. I'm not trying to pin it all on China, by the way. China is one major player. It's by f- certainly not the only major player. Mm-hmm. So, so if I can try to sort of put together the the discussion a little bit, I, I guess my sense is there's emerging technology that you know it's it's everything from being able to order things to your door to being able to uh, um, you know s- speed up your your interactions at the border by having an app instead of stamping a passport. All of these of course, things it didn't speed it up as we all know. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> it, the app didn't work right, like very well. Like let's, let's let's acknowledge that. But 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 in theory, there's these these either present or coming technologies that that could make things a lot more convenient they also provide theoretical opportunities for more observation more control we can see in in certain countries there is use of surveillance technology and that to you know to track people and to provide scores and that and obviously Sorry, which, don't want which, to come here. which countries are we talking about well, uh, for, for instance, the, the use of the social credit score in, in China, right? Well, so, I'm, I'm telling you, this is, not, this is not merely China. This is America. This is Canada. This is almost global now, except it has trouble in parts of Africa and such places. Okay. And, and so this is, this is the, if, if I can understand what the concern is from those who are concerned about 15-minute cities is they see this as ultimately about constraining people to stay in those areas and using emerging smart technology to either force them to or or compel them to. That That is the kind of order of concern that those that are opposed to this are are bringing up. They're not wrong to be worried about that. It is not the only dimension of the problem. Um, It's not the only problematic issue, but it is one of them. They're right to be worried about that. Traveling around the globe is something that the, the wealthy and powerful expect to be able to do and do do. Staying at home is something you may choose to do. I mean, Immanuel Kant, you know, almost never left Konigsberg. Uh, and and never went more than about 50 miles from Konigsberg in his, in his entire life. You can choose that. But these things are, are being increasingly chosen for you. And being confined to a territory is easy if a panopticon has been created digitally to so that the authorities know everything you do, every transaction you make and where you do it and where you make it. So people are not wrong to be worried about that unless there's a robust philosophy of human rights and liberties and of human dignity. You are right to be worried about that. And again, when you read the people who are developing these ideas, they do not have this concept of human dignity and human rights this robust concept that supported democracy. They do not have that. So Douglas, if if someone's prepared to say, hey, I, I want to meet you halfway on this, all right? Let's 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 try to build these kinds of- well, Let's hope subs- it's within 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll meet at some equidistant point and, and we'll walk there. And they say, look, we want to have these kinds of subsidiarity oriented local communities where you know you can you can get your local markets and your local amenities and things can be delivered to you and we want to be able to operationalize that while still having the right and the opportunity for people to travel between these areas to to you know to travel internationally but at the same time, we think they may want to a little less, right? That that uh, if my local community uh, is uh, ha- has the things I want, that I I may want to travel less. But if I want to, that's that's fine. And if there was some way that we could, you know, really have it stamped in stone that we're going to try to have more walkable local communities, and that is where it's going to stop. You know, would you would you say 
okay, sounds great. Or would you say, I can't really trust that it's ever going to necessarily stop there? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the latter. I would say with C.S. Lewis that that uh, we should not be deceived by that kind of uh, promise. Man taking charge of his own destiny, he said. Uh, I mean, all that ever really happens with that is that some people take charge of other people's destinies. That's that's not Lewis verbatim, but more or less. That's the way of things in, in with with fallen human nature. And anyone who believes those promises, it's just to make your life a bit more convenient. And don't worry, we'll leave your freedoms intact, is naive to the point of implausibility. Uh, this is not the way things work. So I guess another another related question to that then is, based on your account of the problem, I mean, aren't aren't we sort of there already in terms of the available technology and not, not there already in terms of, of the implementation, but in terms of, of what, what could happen? Like I have a phone that, that knows my location, right? And, uh, and I use GPS on it, which, which theoretically would make it easy for the right kind of, the right kind of hacker or controller to, to, you know, to find that information. We've sort of gone from uh, that meme on, on the internet where, you know, 40 years ago, it was, oh, no, it was Big Brother watching. And today it's, hey, Big Brother, can you give me a, a recipe for pancakes? Like, like, isn't it just sort of a reality of the technology that all of us use that, uh, I mean, you know, people talk about digital currency, but we all, we all use credit cards, right? So what is different about specifically the concept of 15-minute cities? Do you think it, it enables some kind of new abuse that isn't already abstractly possible with the technology we use? Well, of course, it's possible with the technology we use. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking about it. There's nothing evil about the technology. The technology is only turned to good or to evil. People who suppose that Big Brother it has changed his stripes and is, is morally superior to the Big Brother of the past are making an enormous mistake. What's changed is that Big Brother, an instrument in contemporary and future developments in technology, has instruments that no previous tyrant or type of tyrant ever had. So we have to get serious about this trade-off between convenience and control. It's one thing to be able to use a credit card, but not to have to use a credit card. Mm -hmm. And to have your credit card transactions private between you and the bank or the right. credit card outfit. It's another thing if every transaction is monitored and registered. Right. So I, I guess, and I, I think that's an important point. There's a difference between using a credit card and there's a difference between being told you have to use a credit card. It's okay to have a 15-minute city concept as long as you don't have to stay there. Your your point on the 15-minute cities was is that, the existence of these cities maybe has a tendency to lead to more control. Someone might say the same about credit cards, right? The fact that we use credit cards at all maybe has a tendency to lead to... Yes. Yeah. But the tendency is, is not unharnessed or undesired or undesigned. It's part of a package that is clearly designed. It's not a coincidence that we were given this taste of lockdown and at the same time, given new devices to uh, monitor and control our movements and vaccine passports, which provide the infrastructure for, for passports that include, but are not limited to vaccines and, and, and matters medical. And that we are also now being given 15 minute cities to accustom us to uh, living in, in, a, in a tighter, smaller, more controlled space, which is a panopticon type of space. Uh, I mean, it, again, it, these are not the dreams of people frightened of losing their liberties. These are the dreams of the people who are organizing these things. And you can find it, you can find them saying these things. So people who are concerned are right to be concerned, and they do need to be paying attention to what others are saying on both sides of the issue because they will find actually a fair bit of common ground where people are being truthful. Yes, we're moving towards a much more technologically controlled society. We will be governed by artificial intelligence, 
But of course, there is no such thing as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is just high-powered computers running algorithms designed by people who tell them what algorithms to run. We're in it. We're in a stage where our technology is. It's not our technology that's getting the better of us. It's our lack of clear thinking and and prudential judgment as to how this technology will be used. And there are people there who are who are um, using it in nefarious ways. Our prime minister used it in a nefarious way during the lockdown to do illegal monitoring of people's cell phones. This is a normal way of life now, I'm afraid, uh, amongst those uh, amongst the governing class and especially amongst the commercial class, the high the high powered commercial class. So we, we, again, I'm not against the technology, mm -hmm. but we have to be very clear about the limits we will put on the use of the technology. Yeah, uh, I I think folks, to hurt your your perspective, it's it's really interesting for me to hear it, and thank you for taking the time, Professor Farrow, to, to join us for this conversation. I think there's a lot of a lot of grist for for further thinking and conversation. Folks, stay tuned. We're, we're going to proceed to the second interview right away here. Thank you very much. All right, part two, we have another interview with a different voice on the issue of 15-minute cities. I just want to uh, preface this by saying that our next guest has not heard the previous interview. So this isn't a debate where people are responding to each other's arguments. That, that's great too. Uh, but this is sort of two standalone interviews where you're going to hear a uh, different perspective. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, a city councillor from uh, the city of Edmonton, Andrew Knack, who's elected in the Nakoda Iska Ward. Uh, Andrew, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you have come out and expressed support for the 15-minute cities concept. Uh, my sense already in this conversation is that there's some contestation about what that actually is. So if you can kick us off by telling us, if you were to say you support a f the 15-minute city concept, what do you mean by a 15-minute city? Why do you support it? Why do you think others should support it too? Yeah, and I think you nailed it why it's important to sort of set the definition because I think a couple people, lots of people have lots of different definitions. So for me, when I heard this idea of a 15-minute city a number of years ago, how it was really taught to me or suggested to me was that this is about providing people with more choice in how they want to live their lives. And what I mean by that is that uh, when you think about the neighborhoods we have in the city of Edmonton or in any municipality, do you have access to the things that you would want and need within a 15 minute walk, bus or bike ride? And that's not to say that you have to, you were going to be forced to live within that space, but that you have access to it. So I, I live in an area, and this is how I would talk about it and, and why I'm supportive of it. I live in an area in the city of Edmonton close to Metal Arc Mall. And in my neighborhood, I live within not just a 15 minute walk, I live within about a five minute walk of three grocery stores, a bakery, multiple banks, my doctor, my dentist, my mechanic, a restaurant, a convenience store, a coffee shop you name it, I have access to virtually everything I would ever normally use on a day-to-day -day basis within a very short distance. And not everyone has that opportunity. So, so the work behind a 15-minute city is, have we ensured that our zoning regulations aren't overly restrictive to prevent different choices from happening close to people's homes? So if you look back at zoning over the years, um, you'll see that we, we over time have created far more restrictions and that has actually restricted the opportunity for local businesses to set up or for different housing choices to exist. So that's the idea when I talk about a 15 minute city of what I'm looking for, which is giving people more choice in how they want to live. Right. Okay. So I want to talk about the controversy around this, but before we do that, let's Let's talk about it kind of on the on the terms you're talking about, because it it seems to me that a lot of the way people people live and go seek things has evolved into kind of hubs of particular activities in particular places. Right. So uh, there are places in the city where there's a lot of different restaurants and you kind of, you know, in Edmonton, you, you go to White Ave shop, go to restaurants. And there's sort of this concentration in, in a place. And. You know, people traveling further for things that they want, going to places where there's a bunch of 
whatever that thing is in that area. Uh, and then, um, you know, you, you can see the convenience of that on one level. Uh, I guess one, one interesting example for me here is, is uh, faith communities, right? Like it used to be that you'd have like a small Irish Catholic neighborhood with the local church in that neighborhood, and then you'd have different. But I think it's, it's a, a positive thing that our communities have become more integrated. That means that if you're looking for a particular house of worship from a particular faith or denomination, you, you may have to travel for it. But even more than that, on the on, on faith community side too, like you've got you've got large destination churches that are able to take much larger numbers of people and and offer a more expansive suite of suite of programs. So it is interesting how the concept of fifteen minute cities seems kind of to to pull in the opposite direction of of a lot of the ways we just have come to normally live in the modern world. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interestingly enough, I would say it's almost the return to the good old days of, of like you described, where, you know, folks had, uh, you know, a local grocer and a local butcher, and everyone walked to the neighborhood school, and those choices were available. And over time, we shifted away from that, and, and not necessarily by choice. And I think that's the hardest part is that the zoning bylaws that most North American cities used ended up creating more of that environment where you couldn't have more mixed use together. For the longest hmm. time, even if you wanted to do an apartment building with commercial on the ground floor, outside of very specific areas, it was incredibly hard to actually uh, do that because it really wasn't permitted. Something like White Ave, which we talked about already, uh, based off you know parking rules and regulations that used to exist, it would have been impossible to recreate White Ave in almost any, any part of the city of Edmonton based off old rules, which we have since removed some regulations from. So it's it's giving that opportunity, but again, recognizing to your point that for other people, and even myself, like I love going to Costco. I like to buy in bulk and yeah. I want to ease, it's more easy for me to do that by jumping in my car and driving to Costco than riding my bike and going to Costco, which I've done, but usually when I'm only getting one or two things, but when right. I want to walk, you got to drive. And so it's not about forcing that, it's about making sure that we at least have, have a regulatory environment that allows that whole variety of options. Right. So I can, I can totally see the perspective of saying, you know, it's, it's desirable to have a, a neighborhood grocer, right? And I can also see the perspective of saying, yeah, you want to go to Costco sometimes. And, and there's, there's probably different stages of life, lifestyle factors too, right? If when I was younger, single, you know, uh, I'd, I'd bike and walk much more, right? If, uh, if I'm with the kids, you know, we're it, the, the, the grocery store might be walkable, but I'm packing the kids in the car. Right. And, yeah. uh, and depending on what you do for a living, depending on your, your tastes and appetites, you're going to want to go further. And, you know, I know, I think some of what's behind this is the climate change concern, desire for people to drive less, but even there, I mean, one way that, people have sought to solve this is, is through public transit, which is, you know, say, Hey, yeah, you, you, you can go to Costco, you can go across the city, go, wherever, you know, but we want that to be an option for you too. So if what you're saying here is, Hey, let people live however they want, try to, to coin a phrase, remove the gatekeepers uh, that mm -hmm. are making it harder for someone to open a neighborhood uh, grocery store. Uh, let's, let's try to give them the, the flexibility. And, and, and maybe some of this is, allowing more home base business is that is that part of it too saying that like if someone Absolutely. wants to have a workout gym uh, in their house or a childcare center in their house you know how do you make it easier for them because that means more small operations close by i mean there's if, 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 if people were willing to to hear that and believe you that that's what this was about i don't think there'd be controversy Right. Correct. You're right. Absolutely right. On on the other hand, just I mean, before we go into sort of the what where I think a lot of the, the larger critique is coming from, like there are, there are going to be some people who are going to say, look, I based on my my stage of life, my my preferences, like I don't really care if there's a these amenities are are walkable because I've got young kids or I have you know particular dietary, religious, recreational preferences. I would I would actually rather live in a place that's close to public transit or easily drivable, but I don't care about these amenities. So does, does your sort of vision of this have space in it for saying like, hey, some people are going to want this 15 minute city concept, but some people are just not going to want it, not going to care. Absolutely. And, and for me, it goes back to 
government shouldn't be restricting that. So if you are happy to drive, you know, an hour a day to go get to your particular grocery store, go visit a particular church, awesome. You go do that. You should be permitted to continue to do that without any penalty. But we shouldn't have zoning regulations that prevent that local spot from opening up or that prevent a different style of housing options to exist within a community because that's where it, in reverse you're, we're actually creating an environment and i think we did that in, in edmonton and many cities across north america where you sort of force people into that life which is that you have to have a car let's let's be very honest with ourselves the edmonton region as an example uh, is very car centric. Why? Because the zoning essentially created that. We didn't have a lot of opportunity for more local options nearby that small home-based business, that small childcare center that's uh, you know two blocks away. So it's about letting people do it however they want and making sure the zoning is flexible enough for any person's desires. Is it is it fair to say in terms of of Edmonton and and, and uh, my my life is kind of going back and forth between my riding which is Sherwood Park Fort Saskatchewan which is which is not Edmonton but obviously spend time in Edmonton being right beside Edmonton and Ottawa and you know I I see the differences in terms of uh, Ottawa there's there's a lot of a lot of public transit and it would be be much more common for people to you know delay car ownership have you know fewer cars in their family not have a car uh, and and use public transit is Urban planning kind of like raising children where you can't sort of undo it when they're <laughs> when they're already an adult like is how much of this is baked in I, I guess I, w- one of the points that that I've heard is the idea of 15 minute cities calls for such a radical reorientation of existing infrastructure how do you respond to that I see I actually find the the, the any type of implementation of this um, because it's primarily based off of zoning and land use is mm-hmm. is a very slow change and look no further than where we are in the housing crisis. And you talked, and I really appreciate that phrase, that gatekeeper, because we've heard a lot of that um, uh, around cities that have prevented different housing choices from being available to people, which is why the affordability in those cities is essentially non-existent. Edmonton is, is typically referred to as the most affordable of the major Canadian cities, because unlike most cities, we have far more flexible zoning than most, which is still, I would argue, fairly restrictive, But it's allowed for that to naturally adjust over time based off market demand. And that's really what this is. The city of Edmonton, or any city for that matter, can't turn cities around and change them overnight through zoning. Because really, our role is allow the use to exist. And then the free market decides whether another grocery store can be sustained in a location, or whether a yoga studio can be set up, or a childcare space can be set up. We can't require that. Uh, there's there's really no good way to do that. You you can't even incentivize that in a way that would be logical. So, no, it's it's in my mind this is very much about a gradual shift, uh, and and truly that is very dependent upon the free market. The only exception to that is where we're talking about city amenities. So if we're talking about having a recreation center or a library as an example, we control that because we we're the ones that fund right. the construction of those. But again, I think part of it is even how I look at that, we have to make sure everyone is served by recreation, everyone is served by libraries. So we're, we might be shifting away from that notion of a single mega rec center to smaller recreation spaces that are uh, spread out more evenly throughout the city. But truly, again, even that is a long term change. Yeah. I would say that's that's a lot of libraries and a lot of rec centers if it's within a 15 minute walk, right? Like the nice thing about libraries are, you know, you can have a functioning interlibrary loan system. And if it's working well, that's that still involves someone driving the books back and forth, I guess. But uh, but but, you know, yeah. So so I mean, I, I think this is this is interesting. Now, all of us as elected officials know we're living through a time where there's and I think COVID was a big part of it. There's declining trust in certain kinds of institutions, in politicians. And so I think it is important when you when you hear ideas that you don't agree with to not, you know, dismiss those as, uh, you know, yeah, whatever, you know, but 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 to actually try to understand people on their own terms, maybe, maybe the stories that have things have happened in their life that have led them to to have that level of mistrust. So, so you're, you're obviously hearing, uh, and I've seen some of the reaction online, you're obviously hearing from from folks who who have a very particular understanding of of what 15 minute concept city concept would mean. We heard some of that discussion in, in the earlier segment on the on the podcast. Tell us just a bit about like 
you hearing those arguments? What do you think about those arguments? How do you, how, how do you think and how do you feel about these, these kinds of arguments and how do you respond? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. So what I've often heard, uh, especially in the last few weeks from those who have expressed greater concern is, and, and to your point, when we've asked them, what, what do you define as a 15 minute city? One of the central themes that most folks who have concerns about it come back to is that they are uh, fearful that they will be restricted in their movements or that they will be fined if they choose a particular way of movement uh, that isn't aligned with this notion of staying within this, this space. And I, you know, it's tough. And the reason why I think it's, uh, this has grown in thinking amongst some is because particularly in Oxford in the UK, they have been talking about 15 minute cities at the same time they've been talking about dealing with traffic congestion. And the two have since been conflated uh, as the same thing. And so for those who haven't heard, what's happening in Oxford is that they are, uh, the, the way I would describe it is it's essentially congestion pricing. They are trying to get people to use particular roads. They have a, a ring road that they're trying to get people to use versus driving through the city. And the way they've done it is similar to what you've seen in other European cities is that there is, in their case, you get 100 free trips across the city not using the ring road. But if you then surpassed that point, you would actually be charged for additional uses, like you would a toll road. Okay. And I think why this has gotten to be the, the, what it is today is that even though congestion pricing is not uncommon, London, have, many European cities have it. We have toll roads even in spots like Toronto that, that mm -hmm. have that. So it's not an uncommon tool, but this has been talked about at the same time as this 15 minute city. And so therefore people have associated anybody talking about 15 minute cities as looking to restrict their movements. And clearly, and, and you know, I think we need to just say it very bluntly, I don't support restriction of movement. Uh, while I can understand why some cities use congestion pricing and while toll, ro toll roads might make sense in certain areas like they do in the US or even I think in Toronto that we're built differently. And I don't really see why it would make sense to even consider something like that here. And, and so it's good to be very blunt about that, but that's never been proposed. It's never okay. been suggested. So on, on the con congestion pricing, 15 minute cities uh, conflation. So, I mean, listeners in Ontario will probably be familiar with the 407, which you referred to. It's the, it's the uh, toll, major toll highway uh, in the city of Toronto. And the thing about the 407 is there are lots of other routes. There's lots of ways to get around. So, you know, you, you, depending on where you're going from and to you, you shave off some time by paying the 407 toll, uh, if you choose to, there's fewer people on it because uh, you know because it's a because you've got to pay to go on it. The fact that I think other pe people have lots of other options, it just might take them a little bit longer, would would certainly ensure that people never felt like they were kind of trapped by the toll. I guess you could imagine a theoretical situation in in which a city was designed where you have only toll roads on all side of you sides of you, so you like have to pay to leave your home and. I think whether whether you called that congestion pricing or not, I think most people would agree that that would be a very bad thing. Like we wouldn't want people to be in a situation where the only way they could leave their their home or their own neighborhood would be through a toll toll road. That so that's very different from something like the 407, where you know basically you're you're paying to save a certain amount of time. So so in Oxford, like are there is it more like the 407 or is it more like that hypothetical dark scenario of you know, you've got to pay a toll in order to leave where you live. I think that's part of the challenge. I mean, none of us are folks living in Oxford right now, and we're right. all reading stories coming from different articles and different social media posts. And and what I've read seems to suggest that they do have a, a major roadway that people can use to easily navigate. I'm not sure how other local roadways work in their network, but they do right. have a, a main road that people could use without charge they're trying to avoid people going sort of cutting through and where there's already lots of congestion. But I don't know it enough to say with right. certainty, which is why I get where, where this fear is starting to come in. Because if none of us truly know these roads in and out, we're all sort of painting our own picture of what that actually looks like and then how it could be applied in other cities. Right. And, and I think it's worth flagging, like just how unusual it is that like we're having this major conversation across different different jurisdictions about urban planning right like usually these are hyper local conversations and 
and uh, and yet there are some important philosophical issues that this touches in you know, on, which is which is why I'm interested in it and why I think, you know, we can have this conversation that it'll be interesting to people in other in other kinds of cities. But but yeah, it's it's kind of a this is a sort of a an issue that's taken me by surprise in terms of the level of public interest I've I've seen in it for sure. Yeah, I'll say after years of of being, you know, I'm in my 10th year of being a city councillor and I was a community league president before, uh, urban planning usually weren't the most exciting and well-attended meetings at city council. And, and so in a way, even though this has generated a lot of interest, I'm actually glad people are paying a bit more attention to what land use bylaws are and how right. they work, because it is important. It's actually a really important part about what we do at city council every day. And so even if it hasn't been approached always in the in the best of ways, it's still a topic we should all be following more closely. Right. So I, I think just to come back to the issue of mistrust that exists out there, right? So uh, I think some people would, you know, they, they, would, they would point to some of the things that happened during COVID and they would say, you know, first of all, we were told things were not going to happen that did happen, right? You know, vaccine passports, for example. I mean, no, where, wherever, wherever anyone stood on those issues, you know, there politicians across the spectrum were saying this wasn't going to happen, and 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 it and it shifted very quickly in terms of 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 uh, of, of where politicians were going. And um, the the concern I think is when you have the infrastructure in place that would allow that control, then that infrastructure may be used in a way that is controlling, even if in the present moment the stated intentions or the sincere intentions of people are not to use it in that way. And that's kind of associated with the idea that 15 minute cities would be quote unquote smart cities, right? That they would be, you know, enabled with technology that, that would be, you know, reading people's license plates. And, and uh, you know, this is wrapped up in some of the concerns about digital currency and, and other things, just the, the, the idea that if you have digital currency, digital ID, you know, that, that that there's an infrastructure there that enables information to be gathered more easily. And even if people are saying it's not going to be used in that way, that there's a, there's enough of a mistrust out there that when folks say it's not going to be used in that way, it maybe will be used in that way. So curious for your response to that in general, but then also how you see the role of smart technology linking with these 15 minute cities, because you, you haven't sort of mentioned that at all in the, in the setup of it. Yeah, and, and, and maybe we'll start with that is that and part of why is that truly we haven't really done much of that work like the smart city concept and people will uh, some people pulled up back in I think it was 2018 or 2017 there was a smart city sort of competition Canada wide that was run by the federal government to try to encourage cities to think more about how they use technology to to provide a good quality of life. And most cities, including Edmonton, participated in it. We weren't successful, but um, some folks will pull that and say, hey, see, this is this is what, what we're worried about, and it's going to lead to this. You know, and so there's a big question about how do we, what is that good balance of use of technology? Because on one hand, you know, I think about something like our recent introduction of our smart card, which is, again, not an uncommon tool, but new to Edmonton as an example. But we see it in many cities where you have a smart card for transit. And that's really valuable because it lets you better understand what routes are being used, when they're being used, and it lets you determine how to best deploy your resources when you're trying to figure out how to best use your limited financial uh, budgets, uh, as every order of government deals with. On the other hand, then you worry about, well, to what extent? Just how much information is being collected on every trip? Do they know who I am, where I live, where I start from? And that's an important conversation and one that, frankly, is a more um, within the provincial and federal conversations that it is municipal, but I think it's mm -hmm. one that we we need to have because, you know, I'd hate to throw out technology that can help make life better, but uh, just because we're worried about every single bad thing that could potentially happen. On right. the other hand, I also don't want to give up, you know, full control of my life and, you know, have a, and yeah. I don't say jokingly, but like a chip in my brain that that recognizes everything I do and tailors advertisements to me. And so, there, there's a fine line, but I think it's one we need to have between all orders of government, and it's and it's bigger than just this conversation. Yeah. Um, and then that leads to your other question about how you broadly deal with that that concern, because from a municipal perspective, most of what we do is again focused on land use and and zoning bylaws. So in our case, it's not about setting up infrastructure to to that could even potentially in the future be used to contain someone. 
Our role is, does this land, this parcel of land, allow for an appropriate mix of uses that then the free market will ultimately decide what goes there? And, and that, it can't be misused per se, because that's just zoning. And that's what we've been right. doing for decades upon decades. So that's how I, I try to hopefully alleviate some pe people's fears, because there's a separate conversation that needs to have around smart technology. Right. But then there's this conversation we're having right now about zoning, which is not related to stopping people from living their life. Right. I don't know if that's so much alleviating people's fears as, as telling them their their fears should be directed at another level of government, right? <laughs> so, so well, hey, we're, we're the municipal guys. We're just doing zoning. But uh, if you're worried about tech and privacy, you uh, you really need to worry about what those those uh, those MPs are doing. Right. So, well, we should all have the conversation. Right? And, and again, yeah. I and I get like I've talked to a lot of people in the last few weeks who, who like you say, have a great distrust. Of, of all orders of government, of all folks and across all parties. And you don't um, overcome that just by saying, well, go, you know, I could tell everyone in this chat, just go read the city plan, which we approved, and it will clearly show you there's nothing to be worried about. But trying to tell someone who is fearful or mistrusting to go read something that factually is is clearly true and would, would help address that doesn't address the core, the, the foundational issue that we're dealing with. And so, yeah, we should talk about technology. I don't want to push it just to you or just to the province. We should actually all talk about how we can better mm -hmm. use technology and be thoughtful around the the valid concerns people have around too much control. I mean, gosh, we all know through our phones, like just yeah. how, the amount of ads I get clearly that have heard <laughs> the conversations that are happening <laughs> when I've searched, you're like, we do we should have an honest chat about what what is the right level of regulation on things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess to just build off that point too, like there, there is a bit of a trade-off isn't there between convenience and the, the desire, you know, for, for privacy and uh, not, not just privacy, but certainty of privacy, right? Yes. Because you can, you can say, here's this technology, you know, it's going to, you know, do all these sort of predictive things, things for you. And, um, and it's going to keep, keep track of your recently viewed location so that you can, you know, and, and all those things will be convenient and, and that information will be kept private and secret, right? For many people, the fact that the information is out there is, is concerning enough, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it's, but it, I think one of the factors we're seeing socially, like since COVID is there is less trust than there used to be. Oh yeah. Uh, there is, there is more concern about these sorts of things. And, it feels like we were coming apart more and more. And, and, and part of this too is it was, it was harder to get together during, obviously during COVID, right? There's restrictions, but, but then there was a, a polarization that happened, right? Where, where people that, you know, where you stood on masks or vaccinations, it, it, it constrained people's ability to, to gather in community. So, so all the, all these things have impacted trust and trust in institutions and and maybe also there there are some respects in which our institutions have failed to earn that trust right like we've seen we've seen different sort of major major cultural and social social moments where uh institutions have have failed and deserve to be held accountable for that but nonetheless that doesn't help the, the building of trust either so so where, where do you see this going in terms of like if, if you want to make the case for something like this it, it probably it probably requires people to trust you to a greater extent than, and I don't mean sort of you personally, but pe people have to trust people in your position. And I don't say everybody, right? Cause there's, there's, guess, there's, yeah. you know, but, but, but for, for those, those folks that have felt really alienated in recent years, you know, how, how do you, um, how do you try to rebuild the, their, their trust in institutions? I think a few ways. I think one of them is, is more face-to-face -face engagement break down that barrier because as you noted, I think the loss of that that connection made it easier for people to to look at it a bit more of an us versus them. And so I've been even just in this year, I've already hosted a number of in-person community conversations or town hall town hall esque meetings where we can come together and talk about any issue about what's going on. I've been out door knocking not because it's it's not an election time for the city. We're in, we got an election years from now, but I'm out uh, twice a month, knocking on doors, trying to connect with people to to spend time to truly understand what's going on, uh, to to listen to what they're uh, concerned about, and to hopefully try to provide um, information that will help them feel better about that. And I think the other piece is 
um, really reinforcing how we operate uh, uh, within the municipal order of government. And, and this isn't meant to be a slight to federal or provincial, but it is in a slight way is that almost everything we do in municipal government is public, right? The vast majority of our meetings are public. It, you know, you think about federally and provincially, the budgets, when they're created, they're created behind closed doors with cabinet, and then ultimately they're released on budget day. Um, and yes, yeah. there's some debate that happens afterwards, but <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a done deal. Right? Incidentally, it's very disheartening to hear you, hear you talk this way. Although I, I'm not going to say it's, it's completely untrue. Like I, I the, the design of our system is supposed to be, you know, you, you present a bill for consideration and then it's debated and it, like th there, there is more substantive amending of yeah. of bills that happens uh, including government bills that happens and maybe people think and it's you know part of the process is you have witnesses come forward and then even the government says yeah well maybe we should change that or something we hadn't thought of so so you know anyway that, that that's a bit a bit but, tangential but, but yeah but yeah. it's not it, you know it's it's not wrong that you know when a finance minister presents the budget if you pe people think of it as the budget not as uh you know the first draft of the budget that's going to then be be wordsmithed in the fine points by uh by uh, legislators, right? And, and so I think to, to help with, with what we're trying to do, we want to m remind people that that everything we do, almost, the, the, again, with very rare exceptions, the FOIC rules are very strict about when we can actually go in private. But land use is one of those things that we don't go into private for. So when, you know, every rezoning application is a public meeting that is known well in advance. People can read it, understand it, register to speak to it. Um, you know, the creation of the city plan, which is uh, something we approved back in December 2020, but there were years worth of engagement that started beforehand, which started to talk about this idea of a more complete community. Mm -hmm. And and so making sure people know about how our systems work, and it's not just municipal, but how federal and how provincial works so that people know that they actually can have a voice and that, that we're not all going to agree all the time. But you have the opportunity to really help shape the work that's being done. Right now, we're going through our zoning bylaw renewal. We're looking to potentially reduce the number of zones from 46 zones down to 23, removing some red tape and regulations, not, not making it a complete Wild West. But uh, that draft bylaw, it's 332 pages, but people can read it today and go through it and understand what we're looking to change and share feedback before council even begins debate on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the message is get get involved, right? I mean, and p people have an opportunity to to have their their say on this. So, so you, one thing you said there that I want to just jump off on. Um, you said you've been having this discussion around more more complete communities for a while. This idea of fifteen minute cities, specifically, I mean, it it clearly has an origin given this number, right? It's not ten, it's not twenty, it's fifteen, and and someone thought of it, and someone's been promoting it. It's being discussed around the world, and and. Uh, that is also a source of some, you know, some criticism or some suspicion. So has has the idea of something like 15 minute cities been around for a while? Um, where, what do you see as kind of the, the genesis of this particular idea? And, uh, you know, and, and, and I guess, why, why those specific parameters instead of something else? So the, the concept of a 15 minute city, and again, using the definition we started with at the beginning of having more options around folks, that's not new. I mean, urban planning uh, you know, work has been happening for decades, talking about things like walkable communities or complete communities. So in my mind, this is more just of a, a modernized name because this, this specific naming and concept came out in 2016. Uh, where there was, a, I think it was a Colombian scientist who came up with this, this notion of it. But it's, it's not like it's this revolutionary idea that, that only suddenly existed in 2016. You, you go look back, uh, again, look at most cities when they were built in the you know, when 1950s and 60s as the car was just becoming to be a prominent mode of transportation. Prior to that, that's what we had. So this, this notion of, of having more things closer to home uh, is not new. It's it's this phrasing that's new, and and then most recently in the last I would say three four months, it's it's taken on a bit of a of a life of its own. And and so because even when we were talking about it back in 2018 and 2019 when we were building the city plan, you know I didn't have anyone who was like oh I you know I'm, I'm terrified about this idea. Most, everyone saw the idea and thought oh more things closer to home. I'm not right. you know, I have choice. Great. Um, but now it's become something different in the last few months. But yeah, yeah and it's hard with that. 
Yeah. So do you, do you think the concept uh, needs a rebrand in order to be successful? Or do you think that the, the conversation, the engagement uh, that is, that is provoked by the controversy uh, justifies uh, preserving the, the brand as it is? I think, you, you know, as somebody who, who went to university for marketing, that, that's my background. Yeah. Um, sure, we could rebrand it tomorrow and call it what it like, used to be called, walkable communities. We could call it whatever you want, but I don't think that's going to change the underlying um, concerns that some folks have and that, mm-hmm. that concern around lack of trust. So, because then all that's going to happen is they're going to say, oh, the, you know, it's right. being rebranded, everyone. Look out for right. this name now in your zoning bylaws. Yeah. So better to actually work to engage people to talk about how zoning works how it's being used, talk about the actual policies that are written in each of our cities and our municipalities. And, and if there are concerns that people have, say, hey, I have concerns about this. That's how you're going to work through this, not by simply changing the name, because people, again, people are going to see that and say, oh, you're just changing the name. I see through mm-hmm. you. Let's actually deal with what the, the real issue is, which is a lack of trust that folks have in some of our institutions. Yeah. I guess one final question for me. Do you think we're going to see uh, higher turnout in municipal elections finally as a result of the uh, the discussion around 15-minute cities? Is it is it going to uh, create a sustained level of, of engagement at the at the local level uh, that, that maybe has been lacking in the past? I sure hope so. I mean, it, our, our municipal elections uh, have often trended with no more than a third of people voting. And, you know, uh, I'm sure you would argue the reverse, but I would argue on the municipal side of things, it's, it's, the, it's the order of government that has the most direct impacts on people's day-to-day lives because we're dealing with roads, sidewalks, land use, transit, recreation. And, and so I hope people take a, a more vested interest in it because it really does matter who you elect uh, federally and provincially, and municipally, and on your school boards. It's, it's, it's all of those things. And, and people really should be involved in that. So I hope people get more engaged in that, even if it's coming from a this place starting. Maybe as we talk through it, people will get a greater appreciation and understanding for how, how this system works. Mm-hmm. Andrew Nack, thank you uh, so much for uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, I've I've really enjoyed uh, both of these these interviews we've uh, we've done, uh, and I've I've tried to be fair and give both of our guests an opportunity to to make their case. Uh, I guess one comment for me is uh, I'm thinking about this famous speech called "If by Whiskey," and if you haven't seen it, uh, you've got to look it up. It's a uh, uh, it's where a um, I think it was it was from the Mississippi legislature and someone was asked, you know, are they in favor of or against uh, this is sort of coming out of the prohibition era. They were in favor of or against allowing allowing alcohol. And and then he goes, well, if by whiskey, you mean the devil's brew, the poison scourge, the bloody monster that defiles innocence, etc. And then he goes, but if. When you say whiskey, you mean the oil of conversation, the philosophical wine, the ale that is consumed when good fellows get together etc then then certainly i am for it so so if by whiskey if if by 15 minute cities you mean <laughs> is uh is probably where a lot of people are are going to be on this topic but but thank you everyone for listening if you if you enjoyed this conversation uh, you can uh, find more episodes resuming debate uh, where you get all of your your podcast uh, platforms uh, pardon me on, on all of the major podcast platforms uh, and we uh, we publish about every two weeks. So please leave a review. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, and we'll be back with another episode very soon. Mm-hmm.